Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. This week our focus is on international development. In 2015, the UK joined that handful of countries who meet the long-standing UN target of contributing 0.7% of national income to overseas aid. However, achieving this target is not without controversy and has come under fierce attack. We will be speaking to the politician who pushed the government to finally reaching that elusive target, the former International Development Secretary, Andrew Mitchell MP. And we'll also be hearing from Tasmina, who went to visit people on the front line of international development. But first, let's see some of your tweets, your messages and your emails. Thank you for your tweets uh, and messages. Let's just take a look at a few. Uh, Paul Bowie says, I would love to see a highly regarded oil and gas economics expert on the show, highlighting just how much Scotland has and is losing out on with oil and gas reserve to Westminster. Well, Paul, with uh, Brent crude at touching $70 this week and a huge investment decision announced, that might be a very timely moment to have a look at the oil and gas industry. And then there was a, a great number of messages about Brian Cox, the actor who was interviewed in last week's show. Uh, Shirley Jean Seaton says, I enjoyed your interview with Brian Cox. It reminded me of my old father when he was asked what he thought of Dundonians. After a long pause, he said, Bullshit but fair. Well, Shirley, I think bullshit but fair is a <laughs> great description. And Gordon says, Don't want to give too much away, but two of my favourite things in the Alex Shaman show today, Brian Cox and Midget Gems. That is the Scottish sweet delicacy that Brian Cox was warning us all about. And James McCleary says, Excellent interview with actor Brian Cox. Love that you give proper time for in-depth discussion and not sound bites. How about a Robert Burns special in the next episode? And in a similar vein, Jeff Crowley says, Why does Scotland fail to promote at Burns Week? Well, Jeff, there's a fair amount of celebration that's going to be going on, both in Scotland and internationally. The Robert Burns Federation, of course, is based in Scotland. And uh, check out the Scottish Government app that we produced a few years ago. as has the full body of work in it. And the length and breadth of uh, Scotland and far beyond, people will be making their own celebrations of Scotland's national poet. Anyway, next week, we'll, uh, in the Alex Salmon Show, we'll make our own contribution to celebrating the immortal memory of Robert Burns. Andrew Mitchell was the International Development Secretary of State for the first two years of the coalition government. That's the one elected in 2010. In that period, he set the administration's course on finally achieving a United Nations target on international development. That was the one first set back in 1970. Today he states the case for maintaining that level of contribution. Let's hear from Andrew. The Conservative Coalition Government elected in 2010 was the first government to implement Britain's promise to the poorest people in the world that we would spend 0.7% of our budget, of our GNP, on international development and I believe this is some of the best public expenditure Britain makes and I'm very proud to have been a member of a government which stood by its promise to the poorest people in the world and in spite of a time of great austerity in Britain refused to balance the books on the backs of the poorest in the world or indeed in Britain. Now this budget it contributes to the safety and stability and the prosperity of some of the poorest countries in the world. It stops conflict from starting. Once it stopped it, uh, it then uh, seeks to reconcile people caught up in conflict. And it also focuses absolutely on building prosperity by trying to make sure that economic activity increases because the way the poorest people lift themselves out of poverty is by being economically active. So it has a real impact on the ground in the poorest parts of the world. But it's also in our national interest, every penny of this budget, uh, helps Britain's national interest by making the world a safer and more prosperous place. It increases our own trade and our own safety here on the streets of Britain. And as you look at the problems that are coming down the runway, migration, uh, climate change, terrorism, protectionism, the international development budget spent by Britain really tackles all those things at the heart of those problems. That's why I strongly support it and why I think it's some of the best public expenditure we in Britain support. Well, welcome, Andrew Mitchell. You were the International Aid Secretary who drove the, the budget towards this target of 0.7%, which was achieved in 2015 for the first time. 
But it's now under fierce attack. People say that Daily Mail, other newspapers say that, look, because of the enlarged budget, some of the spending is misdirected. What's your answer to that? Well, it is a large budget, and we have to justify every penny in the way it is uh, spent to the British public. We have to be clear that every pound of hard-earned taxpayers' money that is spent on international development is actually delivering 100 pence on the ground. And I think, in fact, it's one of the more efficient budgets that Whitehall uh, dispenses. But we justify it because it makes the world a safer and more prosperous place. And Britain is a big-hearted country. Uh, and we need to support it, but we need to justify it because it has huge effectiveness on the ground. But we're, we're undergoing a, a major crisis in the, the National Health Service at the present moment. Well, what's your answer to people that look at that uh, crisis in the health service and say, well, look, some of that £13 billion spent on international aid would be better devoted to the health service here at home? Well, firstly, I think you should do both. I think public expenditure should pursue both these objectives. I think they're both very important. I think the international development budget is a huge investment in the future of the younger generation and there is an intergenerational issue in Britain where the older generation have had it rather better than the younger generation have it these days. So I think it's an important investment in their future. But as I say, I think you need to do uh, both, but you need to justify the spending because there's nothing that more irritates people than the suggestion that the international development budget is either being misspent or corruptly taken. Now, Andrew Mitchell, both yourself and your successor, uh, Justin Greening, uh, were heavily committed, seen as being heavily committed to this uh, enlarged international aid budget. Uh, but since then, uh, some people have detected not so much enthusiasm in the, in among the Secretary of State. Uh, indeed, Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, just uh, at Christmas there, talked about breaking old jam jars uh, to use international aid spending for other budgets. What's your view on that? Well, the commitment that the coalition government made, which this government reaffirmed at the general election, is not only to the 0.7, it's also to the way in which that money is spent. And other, other departments who have eligible expenditure under the rules which govern the spending of international development money, they are entitled to spend that money and they should spend it. But it has to be spent well and it has to be spent in accordance with those objectives. Uh, and the Treasury would never allow us not to do that. And it's one of the reasons why I established a watchdog which looks over this expenditure so that the public can have faith that the money is being spent in accordance with those rules and being spent well. But many people in the international aid sector and in, in the voluntary agencies, they see a real danger of other departments effectively raiding the international aid piggy bank, for, for, for example, the MOD, for security purposes uh, and things like that. You, you think that can be prevented in terms of the rules that you established? I think it's not possible to do that because it's not possible to spend it in, uh, in, in the wrong way because the rules governing the way this expenditure is made are so clear. So, for example, there is money from DFID the development department, which is spent by the Foreign Office, by the Environment uh, Department, uh, and also by the Defence Ministry. But they have to be in accordance with the rules. And tackling instability and insecurity, tackling conflict, is absolutely at the heart of uh, international development. It's a totally eligible expenditure. And indeed, conflict is development in reverse, in a sense. Now, when you were international aid sector, you, you must have seen many projects in the ground. C can you? Point one, which you, you found most moving and most impressive in terms of the, the good it was doing to, uh, to deprive communities uh, internationally? Well, I suppose it is the humanitarian relief work that Britain leads in many different parts of the world. Seeing there's nothing more moving really than seeing starving children and seeing the British taxpayer through our efforts coming to the aid of children who are starving. Uh, and uh, I've seen severe malnutrition in parts of Africa, particularly in the Horn of Africa and Uganda. And I've seen the way the British taxpayers' efforts are making a real difference to the lives, saving lives, of people in, in desperate poverty and in desperate conditions. So I certainly saw almost every day that I was Development Secretary the power of good that the British taxpayer was doing through the disposition of this budget. And what would, uh, I think there's six other countries who've achieved the United Nations target, which was set way back, more than a, a generation ago, in the Scandinavian countries mainly. What would your message be to the other rich countries in the world uh, who haven't got anywhere near uh, achieving that target? 
Well, Germany, for the first time, has reached it recently, and I think that's great. Uh, we want to see rich countries putting their money where their mouths have been and standing up and spending this commitment for the benefit of the poorest in our world. And it really matters because the world is scarred by these extraordinary inequalities of opportunity and wealth. And our generation has the power to do something about that. And we need to make sure that our generation steps up and does precisely that. Do you not think there's a danger that, that your trend of conservatism in favour of uh, international development, uh, in favour of key public expenditure, is losing ground within the, the governing party at the present moment. Do you think your strand of conservatism is uh, alive and well? Yes, I do. But, of course, there are dangers in that if you uh, dismiss the budget or disparage the budget, then it will, that will be reflected in the public view on international development and people will, will feel that it's not doing the enormous amount of good that it is. So, you know, it's important that the Conservative Party stands up for this expenditure and explains why it matters. But, uh, you know, the Tory party is a coalition like the Scottish Nationalist Party, and there are different views. Um, and I certainly don't feel alone in expressing the views I do within the Conservative Party on this very important matter. Now, finally, Andrew Mitchell, do you think that your case for sustaining that target of 0.7 per cent of, of national income devoted to international development, do you think that will be sustained and, and win the day? Yes, I do, because Parliament will not allow, even if the government wanted to, the Parliament will not allow Britain to step back from that commitment. And bolstered by that, I have every confidence that the government will continue to stand by this historic commitment that is delivering so much around the world to Britain's interest as well as to the interest of the people we're helping. Now, Andrew, just, just one remaining thing for the, well, for the new year. Uh, for coming on and stating your case, you're entitled to the... The quich, uh, Gaelic for a loving cup. You, you know how you to do this. The whiskey goes in there or some other less potent substance if you wish uh, and then you pass it around to your close friends and only your close friends. Thank you very much indeed. I have a Scottish heritage so I'm familiar with it and I shall uh, use it with pride and pleasure. And Rachel, thank you very much for stating your case. Thank you. Coming up after the break, we'll examine in detail that current controversy around overseas aid. Well, Tasmina speaks to Oxfam about their work in the field. Economic war is unfolding in the realm of education. The right to education has been supplanted by the right to access education loans. Higher education is becoming just another product that can be bought and sold. That it's not just about education anymore, it's also about running a business. Et vous voyez que, finalement, dans cette logique, la connaissance n'a plus qu'une valeur économique. What is the place of students in this business model? Uh, before college, I was poor. Now I'm, I'm extremely poor. Higher education, the new global economic war. I don't think uh, that any country can push a button and get rid of trade. Uh, there's, it's far too important. There'd be far much too political backlash. Money is a very fungible thing, and I think it would be very quick before people found ways around it. Because, as I say, it, it might be damaging, it might cut it back, but the idea that you could do anything nearly <coughs> to stop it is, is very unlikely. Welcome back. The achievement of the UK's international aid target since 2015 has not been without controversy. Although now enshrined as a legal commitment, there has been a powerful newspaper-led campaign to both restrict and better target the £13 billion plus budget. Tasbina has been examining some of these arguments. The UK's commitment to foreign aid has been the subject of considerable debate in the House of Commons. 
What does it say about the priorities of a government when it allows so many operations to be cancelled uh, over the next few weeks, at the same time as pouring more and more money every year into overseas aid? Can I say to the Minister, to the Government through the Minister, that people are now angry about this in the country when so much money, billions of pounds every year, is being spent on overseas aid when it is so clearly needed by vulnerable people at home in the United Kingdom. Will the government get a grip of this? It is massively out of touch with public opinion if it doesn't. The UK government's 0.7% commitment of budget to foreign aid has been enshrined in law since the 2010 coalition government. Of late, however, that money has been spread across a number of departments. I spoke to Head of Advocacy Katie Chakraborty at Oxfam to find out the impact of that on the work that they do. Katie, I'm interested in finding out about some of Oxfam's current work in the areas of greatest need across the world. What are your latest projects? I mean, sadly, it, it, it sort of breaks down as a really an ever-increasing list of humanitarian crises around, uh, around the world. We're one of the um, only major international NGOs actually working inside Yemen, where you currently have 60 million people. That's greater than the population of London and New York combined. Um, without access to, to clean and safe drinking water and we're trying to um, work within there to, to deal with the conditions that we have. And of course as is always the case women and children are disproportionately affected uh, by things that are happening internationally and of course uh, natural disasters. Do you have any projects run specifically to help women find their feet again. Absolutely we do. I mean, we have to take gender and, and the needs of women and girls into account on all levels. So take something like a refugee camp um, without proper feedback mechanisms that ask women how it works for them. Mm. You don't find out things like the fact that inadequate lighting around shower blocks mean that they will go without going to the bathroom for fear of being attacked, going to visit you know, the toilet in the night. Um, without uh, understanding the fears about leaving the camps, for instance, to find firewood in places in Africa, you realise that women are, are sort of going without finding food because they're too scared about leaving the camps and being, and, and being raped by belligerents in, in the conflict. So gender has a huge place in humanitarian programming, but absolutely also in the kind of long-term work we do with communities. And so much of our work with communities is about working with women. And I think getting that point across is really important because there are many and varied views um, and impressions on international aid, and we'll come to that in a second, and mm. the government's commitment, but also public perceptions around it, because obviously a lot of your fundraising comes from, from private entities, from mm. individuals, etc. To understand that this is not just about helping people in these difficult situations, but it's about helping them build, build a future and build upon their skills. And I think as much as can be done to, to highlight that, obviously it must help you in terms of getting people to donate to some of your causes. I mean, British people are through and through tremendously generous. I've done fundraising in the London Underground just around the round in Victoria mm -hmm. for, for so many crises, and people will dip into their pockets, and we see that in comic relief, and we see that in responses to um, disasters. But of course, when the media camera goes away, these, these problems don't disappear. I'd like to come on to foreign aid and international development. We know of the government's commitment since the coalition government of 0.7%. Mm. However, there has been much commentary about how that is now being spent. The Institute for Fiscal Studies said last year that there's concern about an ability then to impact um, on eradicating, hopefully, global poverty if that's to be spread across departments. Mm. And the National Audit Office um, also suggested that was, there needed to be much more um, in-depth analysis of how the money is actually being spent for in departments out with DFID. Mm. I wonder what your, what your view was on mm. all of this and how it's impacting on, mm. if it's not all going through DFID, it's not all channeling, channeling through that, how is it impacting on the work that you can do? And in part of this shows just how um, observed and scrutinised and regulated aid money is. It's some of the most scrutinised mm -hmm. money that the government spends because of this need to prove to the uh, taxpayers and to others that, it, that it's value for money. So, you know, transparency like this and questions like this is all, also always a good thing. It's also worth saying that the vast majority of British aid does amazing things. You know, there are 11 million children around the world that have had an education thanks to British aid. It's helping in Yemen, it's helping in uh, Bangladesh, as I said, it's helping in, in, in Uganda. Um, 
But I do think that it's important to get past the question of how much aid we spend, the sort of 0.7. We've got a cross-party consensus on that, and, and that's great and should be here to stay, and start focusing on, on how it's Although spent. Although UKIP and some Tory backbenchers are challenging that 0.7%. It is still... A, a broad cross-party mm -hmm. consensus, yet yeah, not without its challenges, mm -hmm. but, but we hope um, there to stay. But the question of how it's spent is important. Um, and uh, Oxfam would um, observe the same thing that some of these reports are saying. Mm -hmm. DFID is undoubtedly the department with the most experience and the most infrastructure in place to spend aid money in the way that leads to poverty reduction, which is what it's for. Um, other government departments have a hu an important role to play in development. Um, often it's not about spending aid money, it's doing things like bringing peace to Yemen, which is the ultimate thing that people need rather than aid money. Um, it's doing things like tackling climate change, which is one of the major drivers of poverty. Um, it's um, uh, conducting research. Other government departments have a huge role to play. That could well involve spending aid money. But what we think is that until the right structures, transparency, oversight is in place, we shouldn't see a lot more money spent by other government departments other than DFID. Uh, they're the experts and they're where the majority of spend, I think, should remain. And interestingly, Boris Johnson has spoken of more, I use this word, sensible spending um, of this money across departments. But it, it begs the question, you raise the point yourself, we spend money on international development and foreign aid, but if at the other end, arming mm. uh, um, the Saudis in terms of what's happening in the Yemen, you're almost cancelling out, out a lot of your good work. Yeah, exactly. Spending aid money, as vital as it is, is not the be-all and end-all of this government's global responsibility. We have a responsibility, as you say, we believe, to halt arms sales to Saudi Arabia. We have a responsibility to push harder for peace in Yemen. We have a responsibility to play by international global rules and to uphold them. That also means the roles that are companies use when they're considering their tax base, for instance, because the use of tax havens is, is undermining the revenue that could be used to fight poverty around the world. And of course, government is driven also by public opinion, and public opinion it can be framed by what we read in the press. Mm. And it's certainly been a, a concern to see uh, over the past sort of couple of years, certainly at quite a high level, headlines which are have a very negative impact on people's perception of international aid. Foreign aid is seen as a sort of Cinderella of politics. How can we change perceptions around that? I think it's incumbent on organisations like Oxfam, actually, to inspire people uh, more about what aid can do. There are a lot of risks to be taken in um, delivering aid. You're, you're making investments, if you like, in some of the most risky areas of the world. I think the central political question that there's been around about aid, i.e. how much do we spend, and we can start to have conversation like we do on all other areas of government policy, which is, well, what's the best way to do this? How can we innovate? How can we get better um, at doing it? Um, and how can we make sure that the whole government has a complementary approach to, to ending poverty. What would your message be to Penny Mordaunt, International Development Secretary, in terms of what you'd like her department to be doing moving forward? So we wrote to Penny um, pretty soon after she was um, elected and put Yemen actually top of her radar. And we were thrilled to see her make a trip to Djibouti, which is the port which people use to get into Yemen, and herself have some um, uh, tough conversations, I think, with um, Saudi officials and be in influential in helping to keep the main port of Yemen open. As a woman in cabinet herself, I think it makes absolute sense to do as she is doing, to continue focusing on the role of women and girls um, and the central role of investing in them. Uh, not just um, women's economic empowerment, which is uh, a lot of people are talking about at the moment, but ensuring whether it's in economic life or not that women have voice um, and have a sense of uh, sort of control over their lives and, and, and sort of power in their communities. And it is said if you spend money on women, she will, a woman will look to save, not spend all of it at once and make sure it's spread around a, a greater group of people. It's just very interesting statistics about the importance of, mm. of women and empowering women. And you'll be aware, of course, of the, the Scottish Government's work with refugees. We're very proud in Scotland to have taken in more refugees per head of population uh, than the rest of the United mm. Kingdom, but also the work of our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, in empowering Syrian women to deal with the crisis which is facing to allow them to rebuild Syria. And I, I'm sure you believe, like I do, that women hold the key to to, to the future yeah. and uh, empower those women and they will uh, they will help re help rebuild those countries exactly and and and, uh, and um 
understanding the needs of women often turns out to be the key to understanding what's the right thing to do in any situation because it's the needs of women often are about also the needs of families, the needs of communities, the, need, the needs of people who are going to build back a sort of a, a stable life. So whether it comes to refugee policy, where at the moment we're focused on the need for family reunion in the mm. UK, there are too many people here who have re reached supposed safety here in the UK, but aren't able to build a life here because they're denied, uh, you know, their adult children, even if that's only a 19-year-old girl alone in Europe. Um, they're, and they're denied other family members that they, they care for. So, yeah, the needs of women, families, communities, to be resilient, uh, to help each other, I think that is a, you know, it's, it's an inspiring message to think about development in 2018. It is. Kate Chagraberti, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. Bye. Well, watching Kate from, from Oxfam, I, I thought one of her key points was when she said, look, international aid budget in its own is not enough. It has to be consistent across the the range of government policies. Can you give an example of where policies might come into conflict? Well, it's a point well made by Kate, particularly in this week where information has been released that in the year since the Brexit vote, there have been £3 billion worth of arms export licences issued by the UK government, 1.1 billion of those in relation to Saudi Arabia. And so it does become a vicious circle and should be questioned. Another key point from, from Kate was the role of women, uh, the targeting women's role in development. How, how, how is that so important? Well, there's a couple of aspects to that. There's the immediate aid and the aftermath of, of attacks um, and helping people, you know, helping women rebuild um, their homes. But beyond that, it comes to rebuilding their countries and giving women the skills that they might not necessarily have to enable them to do that. It's a hugely empowering thing and something that Oxfam and many other agencies are committed to doing. People just say empower women and you can rebuild your nations. And how about this diversion of siphoning off uh, money out of the international aid budget and, and other departments sort of filching it? How, how big a danger do Oxfam see that is? That's one of the greatest concerns for aid agencies because the DFID budget is greatly scrutinised and you know whether the money is being spent if it's all channeled through DFID. But Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, has suggested that there are more, I use this word, sensible ways of spending that money and it will go across different departments. And that has started to happen. Uh, that then can impact on the effect uh, that the different, different department can uh, have on ensuring that they are contributing the to the eradication of global poverty because it's being spread across a number of places. And despite the, the attack, some quite ferocious at the present moment on the concept of having 0.7%, and that target's been around longer than I've been in politics. So there must be a huge level of satisfaction among the international aid agencies that that target has finally been stuck to and hopefully adhered to. Absolutely. Securing that amount of money has been hugely important to our commitment to international aid, and it's enshrined in law, and that's a very good thing. Ensuring that's protected and ensuring that it's not infected by the often uh, front-page headlines we see where uh, it's questioned why there we're even spending this amount of money in the first place must remain at the top of our agenda. I think in the main, people across the whole of the United Kingdom are very proud of our commitment to helping people in conf conflict zones rebuild their lives. Tasmina, thank you very much. Now, £13 billion is a fair whack of cash in times of austerity. However, it's not even three quarters of 1% of the national income of the UK. Joining that select club of countries who make this sort of level of contribution was a proud boast of the Cameron government. And I'm certain when asked to detail the achievements of his time in office, the former Prime Minister turns to this subject rather than the Brexit referendum. Some MPs, backed by much of the press, will huff and puff about a wastage of resources. But most people see the essential point about contributing something to those in this world who have nothing. A more immediate danger is the diversion of international development funding into other budgets. For example, the line between international security spending and genuine development spending can be a very narrow one indeed. But let us hope that that line is drawn firmly. To do otherwise would be to strike a fatal bargain, to sacrifice the world's poor to release a few billion pounds, to sacrifice moral authority to political pressure. So from all of us here at the Alex Salmon Show, goodbye for now. <laughs>